Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Swerve With Me. This is a show where we have adult conversations for mature audiences only. I am Miranda Innes, and as always, it is a delight to have you in. So we're giving people some time to come in, but I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming back to this week's show, Michael and Cooley Wilson. Last week, we started an interesting conversation about life, relationships, love, family. We talked a little bit about tragedy. And tonight we wanted to continue that conversation because it was such a rich conversation. So come on and tag somebody. Let them know Swerve is back on. And we want to continue this conversation that we know is going to be a blessing to so many. I got to tell you that this week was such a challenging week for me. Oh my goodness. I have battled um, a lot of different things in my lifetime. And this week, one of those of you who are aware, I am a rheumatoid arthritis warrior. And this week I had a major flare up. I'm talking like major flare up and it was really, really painful. So I had to struggle. I had to really, really struggle to complete some assignments and to do some things. But as always, the lessons that are taught to me is just because you're having challenges, that doesn't mean you have an out or an, you have to opt out of completing your assignments. It's your duty, it's your responsibility to complete your assignments no matter what your challenges may be. So even in the midst of the painful uh, pain that I was experiencing during the week, I simply had to complete those assignments. And so I want to welcome. Good night, Elder Inslee. Good to have you. Tag somebody. Let them know that we're on tonight again with Michael and Cooley Wilson. We'll be continuing our conversation about love, relationships, overcoming grief, the life lessons that they have learned. And I have learned so much just from being in their company. I got to say now that I'm putting them on the rank as one of my favorite couples. So I, I think I'm going to be calling on them. I'm putting them on notice now. I'll be calling on them again, uh, much in future to, to perhaps to help to co-host in some respects or do something because I just enjoy their spirit. And I know that whomever may uh, hear them are definitely going to be encouraged and to be challenged tonight. Good night. Good night, Deanne. Good to see you. Welcome. Thank you for serving with me tonight. So tag somebody. I'm giving some more people time to come in because I want to continue this conversation once again. For those of you who are just joining us, I'll be speaking to Michael and Cooley Wilson tonight. We are going to continue the story of how they have learned how to swerve over the years to, to adjust. They've been together for some 25 years or so, and they've learned a lot about each other. A lot about life and I encourage you to tag someone good night Monique good night Addie Liz thank you for tuning in so I want again I want once again to say that the stories that you will hear tonight are certainly to push to motivate to inspire to encourage someone who may encounter a similar situation that they may have faced or who knows may just be preparing you to be able to help to guide somebody else who may be going through the situation. So help me welcome to Swerve With Me once again, Michael and Cooley May Wilson. Good evening. How are you? How are you? Hi, I'm doing, I'm doing really good. Um, you guys listening, hi Jerusha. Let me know if you hear any feedback tonight because I'm not sure. Last week we were having a challenge. Can you hear? Somebody is watching. Let me know if you can hear quite fine without feedback. So I don't see any comments. I guess we're good. I guess we're good tonight. Thank God. You guys look nice. Lovely colors. Oh, thank, thank, you. Nice. thank you. Thank you. So, okay, everything's fine. Thanks, cuz. So we're picking up the story for those of you who... Uh, did not see last week's um, episode. Oh, by the way, y'all please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's called Swerve With Me. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm trying to build up my numbers there. Good night, Brother Roll. Good night. 
Hey, good night, lovely K Green. Good to have you. So for those of you who may not be familiar with their story, Mike is a PK. Cooley is a church girl. And they got together, fell in love eventually, and had a son, a beautiful son, out of wedlock. But they weathered the storm. They weathered the storm. They, 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 they outlived all the stuff that no doubt church folk would have said at the time. All the things that were spoken against them. All of the hurdles that they had to overcome. They weathered those storms and eventually got married. Had a beautiful boy. What is a PK? A PK is a pastor's kid. He's a pastor's kid. That's what he is. Um, and so they weathered the storm and, and had a beautiful son named Michael, his junior. And then he, they got some pretty terrible news at some point that something was wrong with him. So I want to pick up the story from, tell us about, first of all, tell us who um, little Mike was. I don't know who wants to start. Tell us the kind of child that he was and the joy that he brought to your life. So who wants to start? I'll start. I'll start. The, little the little general, general. I, I, the little general. The little general. Um, um, he was, he was in, in, that was my, that boy. my boy. He stuck, stuck with, with me. me. Uh, I tried to get him involved in everything. Um, he is definitely one of those children that as you start to, to rear a child, you can say, wow, this boy is sharp or this is a manly little boy. All of those things, that's what he was. Um, that was Little Mike. Little Mike happened to be a godsend. Uh, he loved to pray. He understood what it is to be a Christian. He, he knew right from wrong. And uh, more importantly, he understood us as it relates to fatherhood, motherhood. He understood us as parents. And that's, that's what... what the unique, the unique thing, thing about, about little Mike was. So, so when you say he understood you as parents, let's let's talk a little bit because that's an interesting thing to say about a kid. Exactly. Exactly. Um, um, a child, a child only, only thinks, thinks about, about today. today. Little, little Mike was one, one of those things that she, was, she crying. was crying. He would he say. Would say what is what wrong? wrong? He's going He's to going try, to try and, come and come ask her, her what's going, what's going on? on. He would he say, would to, say me, to me, Dad, Dad, Dad why is it is that, that you're doing, doing this? this? What, the, what, the, what, happened what happened with that? And so he would always keep us or keep me and her when it's not checking on us. He is one of those little kids who will actually check you to say, why are you doing this? Um, I remember vividly a story while we were in the United States doing our medical care. Uh, Bishop Ellis and Lady Ellis came into the hospital to see him. And he had just taken his chemo, so he was a little lethargic, but he loved to play dominoes. And I don't know if anybody knows Neil Clarence Ellis. He loves a domino. And uh, sure enough, they started playing some games. After the whole one hour, little over an hour, Bishop Ellis says, we have to leave. I need to pray for you. Here's what this young five and a half, almost six-year-old turns and says to the bishop. Bishop, I know what you're going through. I want to pray for you. That's what this little boy said to the bishop who came, flew in to see him. And uh, he rested his hand on him and he prayed for him. And of course, you know, bishops say, no, 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 I'm the bishop here, so I got to pray for you, got to do the last prayer. But that's the kind of a child he was. So remind us coolly about his diagnosis, what happened, and then we'll pick it up, pick the story up from there. Um, it was sometime back in November 2001. Um, I picked him up from school. We were doing some homework. And we were in the bed. I can remember we were in the bed and he said to me, 
oh well i don't i don't remember i'm like come on this this one easy you you got all the other ones come on and i tap him with the pencil and that mark was like a bruise and i'm like oh wow it was just a little tap how come that keen you know bruise like that and i'm just let it go and it stayed for about two days two to three days and one that afternoon, he came back from school. He bumped into something. There was another bruise. And it's like, okay, the bruise is just coming easily and they're not going away. I'm like, what's happening with my child? That same afternoon, he went to use the bathroom. And in his stool, he said, mommy, come here. When I look in the toilet, the toilet was, the stool had blood, blood in it. And I am like, oh, no. I told Michael, I said, we need to take him to the clinic right away. We went to a private clinic right there on Collins Avenue. And the doctors, we told them what happened. They looked at the marks, the bruise on him. And the doctor, she, she was like, okay, well, there's nothing we can do right here. I need to send you to the hospital. So she said, I'm going to call Dr. Sinqui. And she would meet you at the accident and emergency right there we left from the horse from the clinic we went to the hospital dr sinkwe came and she examined him she told us to go out in the waiting room she examined him she came back and said we have to admit him on the ward to do some more tests so i'm like what what was happening what is it serious you know i'm, I'm trying to get all of these questions because they're trying to get all these answers because a lot of questions going on in my mind and I'm trying, just trying to figure out what's happening with my child. And she said, just give us, give us a couple hours, Ms. Wilson. We, we just need to make sure when we do the test, we need to make sure when the test comes back, we can get the results come back. We can give you um, the results. So we are waiting, waiting after they did, we could have, we saw him. We went back into the room with him and we were waiting. And then like about two to three hours later, she came back. She said, I need to speak with you guys like right now. So when she said that I could have seen the seriousness on her to say, okay, this is major. Something is definitely wrong. We went into the room and she started to say, um, little Mike have... No, she said, Michael have AML. When she said that, I really didn't know. I'm like, what is that? So she said, it's a rare form of cancer. When she said cancer, Miranda, my heart stopped. I just couldn't move anymore. And, and, and she was talking and I really didn't hear much what she said after that. I just heard cancer. And she got into it and she said, okay, this is this form of cancer, it's rare. It's only found in adults. She said, but we can treat it. But we cannot treat it here in the Bahamas. I'm going to have to send you to Jackson Memorial. I'm like, what, when, when, what, what could we, what, and I'm just asking in my mind, when, when could we leave, what we need to do? And she said, you need to leave like tomorrow. That's how serious it was. She said his platelets, his blood is low. We're going to have to give him some blood and then he would be able to travel. So we left the hospital that night and in shambles, you know, we give the our parents the news, we give the family the news, say exactly what we had discovered, what was wrong with him. He said, okay, don't panic yet. Let's wait until we reach or wait until you arrive in Florida. Wait till you arrive in Miami to Jackson. And then they would say exactly to confirm if that's what he has. Because why would a child have this adult disease? So we couldn't put our head around, wrap our head around what was happening and why is he, you know, why he was bruising and why 
all of this stuff was happening and now to come to say, okay, he has cancer. Um, you know, we went home, we got as much done as possible, preparing to go to Florida, go into Miami the following day. We took the flight into Miami, um, checked him in right into the hospital. We checked him into the hospital and we had a team of doctors. We had a, I think it's a caseworker, they call it. We had a caseworker that was assigned to him. They also provided us with information because we were going to have to, I think they knew from what Dr. Sinqui said because they trusted her judgment and her diagnose. So they, they, they assigned a caseworker to us. They assigned some place for us to stay. The Hope Lodge, they assigned that, that, that area for us to stay. I'm like, stay, we gonna be here that long or we gonna have to, they didn't say get a hotel. They assigned a resident for us to stay. So I'm thinking, wow, this, this, this could be long. This is really serious. Moving on back to the hospital. We they told us they would um, run some tests, so it's no need for us to stay there overnight, which we did not want to leave him. But we had to go and check into the Hope Lodge. So we went, we did that, came back to the hospital the following morning, early that morning, and met with the team of doctors. And they confirmed that it was cancer. So after getting this confirmation, Mike, I know um, usually men are not very verbal in expressing, most men are not very verbal in expressing um, their feelings. What were you as the father um, thinking at that time, um, and, and as she was processing and, and no doubt asking a myriad of questions, what was your posture at that particular time? Well, I'll say this: I, it was always it was always my intent to be strong, to appear strong, so that she will never feel there is not anybody that I can lean on. And so I wanted to be that person. So if you talk about what is my mindset, my mindset and my posture was two different things. In my mind, there were questions of why is this happening to my son? There was other questions like, why is it happening to our family? Because out of the three sons that my father has, I said this, I always ask this question, why my family? But God has a different plan and he, he, he knows all things. So <clears throat> again, my posture was I needed to be strong. And then being strong meant, hey, you got to make sure I provide. You need to know what is going to happen next. You need to know how are we going to eat? You're going to need to know where we're going to sleep tonight. And then there were some other things that came up that who's the doctor that's going to be seeing him? Uh, how can I retrieve information? And so at this hospital at Jackson Memorial, Jackson Memorial um, opened the hospital up to us where we could have gone and literally researched First of all, what is it that is AML, which is acute myeloid leukemia, which is only found in adults. And that was in 2003. So what was only found in adults is not only found in adults today's day. However, though, it was really unique in children. And so um, finding ourselves mentally was one of the greatest um, hurdles that we had to have gotten over. 
And I'm glad we are at this point because this is the point in our relationship where for the first time, I think we really was doing good. Um, there was questions saying, well, I wonder, is it your, your family who has cancer? Or is it my side of the family who has cancer? We couldn't put our minds around it. Uh, we started to ask logical questions about, do you think it was, because Michael loved these warm-up noodles. And every time you hear, can I get some noodles? And we pop it in the microwave and poof. We were thinking, what if it was electrical things with this food that we gave him? And there was a lot of questions going in our minds. And um, having teams of doctors around, uh, the issue is we started to ask questions that started to test our relationship. Not only our relationship, but our relationship with God. And so... We are now, yes. Okay, yeah, I, I want to want to stick a pin there because I think that's important what you said. In, in facing a challenge such as that where your baby boy is, is diagnosed with this adult disease, you have no idea where this came from or why. The questions, I'm sure just in that challenge of God, what it, why is this happening to us? What did we do wrong? Um, then looking at each other. So so let's let Cooley pick that up a little bit from her perspective, and then I'm going to come back to you. Those questions that Mike um, mentioned that you began to ask, what were some of the questions that perhaps you were saying to God or you were saying to Michael? Hi. Um, I was really, really upset with God at that time because I couldn't figure out why? Why us? What did we do wrong? I'm like, Michael, what did you do wrong? You understand? I'm trying to figure out, did I do something? I'm thinking back in my mind, did I do something wrong to warrant this? Why God? Why? Why us? Why now? We're just, we're, we're young. We, we, we just, we just got married um, four to five years in have a beautiful son, looking to start a new home. Why now? Why us? We, we're Christians. We're in church. We, we're doing ministry. Why? So it was a lot of questions at the time. Miranda, I want to I wanna end this thing about questions. So that when we move to the next point, I want to say here, though, right at this point, for those persons out there, when we walk in this thing called life, when you are in it, you can see where you were going. And this is where this thing called faith. Now, I could talk about it now. But again, when we sat and walked that walk, there were so many questions and I believe if it were not for our upbringing, if it was not for the people that were praying for us, I don't believe we would have overcome it, coming out with all, with everything, with our love, with our marriage, with our relationship. And... Um, I just want to say to people out there, as you go through what you go through, know that the steps of righteous men and women are ordered by God, which means God in his permissive will allows us to walk some stuff. Even though we can't trace him, you have to trust him. That's what I got out of that. Because there was a time I even asked church people when they said, oh, Brother Mike, I know how you feel, man. And I replied, you do not know how I feel. And so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those very cordial people. But that's when the thing hit the fan. But again, now, years later, 
I'm telling you, I'm able to say unequivocally, if God permitted it, all you got to do is just walk through it. Because even though you may not be able to trace him, you could still trust him. Okay, that's good. That's really, really good. So you're going through this process now of dealing with all these doctors and, and um, just um, grappling with you presenting with a situation that you have no control over. You don't understand why it's happening, but you know that it's necessary for you to be there for your son every step of the way, to be there for each other every step of the way. And so he's going through this process of getting chemo. And at some point, Michael, you have to return to the Bahamas because you have to go back to work. Um, and to make sure that these things are in place, you know, as financial support, insurances, whatever that takes, to make sure that she has what she needs to manage on a day-to-day -day basis with him and so on and so forth. So with that in mind, Cooley, you're left there in Florida alone, um, day to day, dealing with this. Um, how are you handling this? Well, at the time, um, that mother, that mother put kicked in to the point where I know I had to be strong for him. So even though I got tired sometimes and I still had to show up to the hospital, well, Michael wasn't there, so we couldn't do the shift. We used to do the shift. Michael would stay in the night and I would go in the day. Michael would come home in the day and sleep and I would be there um, all day. He will go back to the night for the night shift. That, that couldn't happen anymore. So I had to take my time to say just to be there with him I had to move it up. So I would leave there, say, sometimes 7 o'clock in the night, sometimes 9 o'clock in the night, just to be there until he basically dropped sleep or whatever the case. But at the time, I had to show him that I was strong. I couldn't let him see that I was, you know, getting frustrated or getting tired or being even being angry because I was like, okay, why am I to leave me here? It's just me. Just ask your boss for more time, even though I know now understanding that he had to be to work because it's stuff that he had to do on this end to make sure that we were straight on that end. And I couldn't understand it. Being young, all of this is just dropping our laps, especially like, okay, this is nothing that we planned for. So I'm like, okay, why am I here by myself? I know back in my mind that he has to leave, but I'm still asking the question, why am I here? I'm like, okay, when we talk, Michael, why why don't you just ask your boss to allow you to come back? I know he would let you come back. And, you know, we'll have that argument on the phone. You say, oh, no, but then I have to be here. No, you don't. You don't. And then that's how I felt. So I really was frustrated and really upset to the point to say, well, I'm doing this by myself. And I think there was a time that I say, I'm doing this by myself. I feel like as, as if though I'm doing it by myself, which I know deep down. And I can understand now looking back that, no, he really was there, but he was supporting you in a different way. Okay. So, Mike, I want to ask you, you having to leave her no doubt was equally as traumatic for you because while you were obligated to go back to work you were leaving your son and your wife there alone so how did you manage the emotions that you were having at the time man listen thank you i wanted to jump in right there when cooley was talking because when you are young oh man when you are young you you do things and you do it differently. Um, but the question to me was, I was a logical thinking individual who believes um, if you say you are a man, you have to do man up. 
Man up means provide. So here's the thing. I spoke with um, my insurance company and the insurance company says, settle down. I see where you are. Do me a favor. When you go over there, we're not going to give you any money. Here's what I'm going to do. Whatever you spent, uh, if you go and get any drugs, you will pay 20%. Give, bring the receipt back and we will pay, take care of the 80%. And uh, you just take care of the 20% but bring the receipts. When I spoke with my boss, Assistant Commissioner Ellison Greenslade at the time, he says, Mike, listen, I, you have my support. You tell me what you need. When I spoke with uh, Bishop Ellis, he says, you have our support and our prayers, which means to me, I was getting all of my bases covered, but I wasn't, I'm not saying to her, this is what I'm doing. So I'm in Freeport and I'm working my proverbial tail off to make sure get it done. Make sure the ducks are in a row that when I come over, she doesn't have to ask the question anymore. How are we going to pay for his week's chemo? She doesn't have to ask the question, do we have money for food? She didn't need to understand when the hospital says, sign these papers so that they can get their money. All of that was taken care of. But here is the kick. When it comes to a relationship, it is more than just you thinking from a man's perspective, I got it covered. When in fact, I think it comes with maturity, but never said to her, baby, I got it covered. This is what we're doing. So she could be in her mind. So as a woman, this is where the testing came in our relationship where she thought she was doing it all by herself. And I'm in Freeport working by myself. So I don't have a woman to hold. I don't have a son to hold. Uh, I don't have that family like I thought I did before. So Mike is, everything I do is, I don't mind working. Yeah, chief, would you need me to do something? I'll work. I don't mind working. If you want me to do some overtime, I don't mind working. Just to get my mind, keep something doing uh, in my mind. And so that's where I found myself. Guess what I was doing? Literally doing this. Moving away from the one person I should have been protecting because she is arguing with me, fussing that I'm not doing enough. I'm not here enough. And I'm saying to myself, oh my goodness, what else can I do? And this is where in our life, in that full between six to eight months, we struggled in our relationship. It did not, did not end, you know. Do you know why? I believe because she was there and I was here. But when the when the opportunity for me always arose to go back over there, which I, I took every opportunity to go and see my son and to be with her, I did that. But I'm only saying times of testing for our relationship was after you got a diagnose. Hmm. Now you are living this thing out. We are at this place in our life where we start asking questions between us and God. And then there is a division because we don't keep God in the midst of our troubles. And we start splitting. You stay over there, continue to do it. I'll be over here doing it. Now, like I say, I don't know how, you know, I get, I get emotional sometimes thinking about it. But I'm looking now at the end of this thing, Miranda, when we now are, six, are spoken to by the doctors to say he is in remission. Y'all can take the boy home. And so 
One year, months later, we are back in Freeport with our son, and we are together trying to, you know, live our lives again. And uh, here comes this this thing again. Uh, after he is in remission, here comes this cancer again. And the doctor says, when we went back to the States, that statistics have said, anytime a cancer comes out of remission, that means it gets a little bit more, more aggressive. aggressive. And so instead of him being months and years, in, 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 it was a matter of weeks that they said, his cancer will take him. And uh, that was three weeks, the doctor said. Uh, he lasted three months. Um, but at the end of the day, now Cooley and Michael are dealing with a past son, a son that has gone on to be with the Lord at the age of six. And so the story even gets... I want to I wanna go back a little bit. If you're just joining us, I'm talking to Michael and Cooley Wilson, and they're talking about dealing with grief and managing their son's illness and, and their relationship at the time. And I want to take you back a little bit because, Mike, you said a lot in terms of while you thought you were doing your best to provide, um, in, but you weren't communicating with your wife. And she was there day to day feeling the weight of this, but she didn't understand you were doing and making things happen so that she could be there day to day and get the bills paid and everything. And because you were not talking to each other, uh, a, a kind of riff was building between you, but but you managed to still um, get through that. And, and I want to go back to coming home returning with him the cancer because you jump all the way ahead but i want to talk about getting that good news that the cancer is in remission you can now go home and the fact now that this relationship what was pretty much long distance for a couple of months now you're back home together day to day with each other and managing him let's talk a little bit about what that period was like even before that, Miranda, um, when we found out, I think it was after his birth for his birthday, the third of March, two thousand and two. The make I'm not sure if you heard about the Make a Wish Foundation. They would grant a child a wish. This little boy had so much favor on his life. He got two wishes. He got two wishes. The case, um, the case worker that they assigned to us, she introduced us to the Make a Wish Foundation, and she said, "Okay, what? Give him the opportunity to choose what he want." He had. Uh, I'm thinking that it's a trip to Disney World for a week for all expense paid. You get to go on all the rides. You get to do whatever you want to do. And it's uh, $500 shopping spree. Also, you had an opportunity to go to the Miami Dolphin game, the football game. So, well, I think Michael coaxed him to say the football game because he really didn't know anything about the game. So he said, okay, could I have two wishes? So she said, well, um, you, all of the kids just have one wish. So he said, but it's my birthday. Couldn't I have two wishes? And the caseworker went on. We, we thought nothing of it because he said he wanted. He, he, they asked him what you want to do. Said, okay, my first wish will be to go to Disney World. And then... Could I go to the football game? So she said, well, okay, let me just check with them, Lil Mike. Because everybody started calling him Lil Mike now. Let me just check with them, Lil Mike. Let's see what they say. I'm not going to promise you. Say, please tell them it's my birthday and see what they will do. He's talking to the caseworker. That's why I say he was a special child. He was a special child. And the caseworker, the next day, she came back and she said, you know what? They granted you both wishes. 
So he got to go to the, we went to Disney World for a week. When we came back, um, then him and Michael went to the, to the football game, to the see the Miami Dolphin, took pictures with the cheerleaders and they were in their element. They were in their glory. <laughs> so he came back, then we- Dolphins we forever. It was, it was time for us, it was time for us to come back home. <laughs> Seeing the joy, knowing that he was in remission, I'm like, God, thank you for healing my son. Everything else was small stuff. That was the greatest thing for me right there. Just to see him up and energetic and not weak anymore after taking the chemo and he's smiling and he's talking and want to be interacting and he wants to let's go to the playground and being a child that was a joy for me knowing that okay he was going to be able to come home in a week that put dyson on the cake i'm like we're going home as a family we're going to be together now as a family he's in remission no more cancer no more cancer cells no more. We'll go to the doctor um, for checkup in the next month and see exactly where he's at. And I'm, I'm believing God because when we go to the doctor, he would still be in remission. I'm believing God for this healing, total healing. We came home and, you know, family came, celebrate with us that he's in remission. We went to church, the church folks celebrate with us, our village celebrate with us. We had a great support team. Everyone celebrate with us. And we went back that month for his checkup. Here comes the news again. Okay, wow. So you get this this news like a month later and Mike just let's let's talk about that what in the world were you feeling and thinking when you got this news after coming off such a high you know at that time Miranda I'll, I'll say this to you man I'll say this to you you gotta walk it you gotta walk it the one good thing about a parent is whenever you see your children happy, whenever you see you are doing all that you can to provide for them, no matter what they're going through, you, you, you saying, I see them happy and that's the blessing to me. So coming back to to Grand Bahama, this may sound crazy. Do you know what my real concern was about? Kuli, you believe that? That was my real concern. Kuli, because one of the things at that time in my young faith, I was crazy enough to say, when you put it in God's hand, you have to let God do his work. Because if you start saying to God what you want done, what now happens is opportunities come or arise where it could go south. And that's where a lot of Christians find themselves thinking God should do it this way. But God says, I'm coming another way. And so home with my family, I'm in my element, man, being used by God, still playing drums. Uh, I'm I'm in my element. Um, I'm under the I'm under this thing where I I feel good as a husband, feel good as a father that I've done my thing. Oh, by the way, that's when I recognized too how much money was spent. We were over eight hundred thousand dollars. The 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 Jackson Memorial said was our bill. And what did God do for us? God says, I don't want you 
to pay a dime. The, the money that you spend on your on your medication, the insurance says, I want to give that back to you. And then the medical bill, the people says, no, man, I don't know who y'all know, yeah. but y'all are some big timers, zero. man. It was zero. I didn't know they do it like that in the Bahamas, but y'all are some big timers. Y'all don't owe us a thing. And I walked out of that, the United States, $800,000 debt free. I walked out of the United States, jumped on a plane with my family. I walked into uh, the airport into Bahamas and I told a lady, listen to me, my wife, them coming in. I don't want no car. I, it has to be a limousine. And uh, Ethel Rule, I will, God, I'll always remember um, the day my son talked to her. She says, listen, man, I don't care what it is. Just give me $50 for the fuel because that little boy who you had there, uh, he is something else. That's my little boy. And I paid the woman $50 to get a limousine from the airport to my house. And the police officer saying, boy, whoever this guy is, he really saying something. Uh, but that's what it was. That's my thought. That's my feeling. I, I do believe moving moving out of of that takes us into a next place that I now understand I had to walk that road. Okay, let me just get in a couple of comments here. Um, Joba says, go through the process. God is with you. Manira Oliver said, uh, sis, y'all make it look so easy. Only God. Elder Inslee says, I could understand what you were saying because in my life, I asked God to why. And God told me, why not you? And she's talking about a similar uh, a situation that she went through. Elder Inslee, by the way, was burnt over, I can't remember what percentage of her body, but like completely burned. And God healed her and restored her. She has an amazing story. So she says, it was for me to have a testimony. Everything is done for God to get the glory. And you right now are giving God glory by your testimony tonight. Crystal, hey Crystal. Crystal says, sending love to Cooley and Mike. I'm so glad I got an opportunity to meet little Mike. He was truly a gem and left his mark. He'll never be forgotten. Okay, Elder Inslee says she was burnt over 60% of her body. So... Thank you guys for the comments. Keep them coming. So Mike and Cooley, you you get the the um, news again that the cancer returned, and and um, you go back and and what do you decide to do? Go back into chemo again, or once you got the news, tell me what what did, what were your decisions? What were you thinking at that time? I'll say this to you, I'll say this to you, Miranda. It was not our decision any longer it becomes a medical decision because if you are if you are sick and you go into the hospital the doctors are the one who will give prognosis and so the prognosis on a child that did all of the chemo uh went through all of that cycle and it comes back the doctor says his body, his body will not be able to take another round of chemo. And so if we wanted to see the child in a good state, a healthy, vigorous, robust state, it is important that we do not subject him again to chemo. And that's when they said to us, bring him home make him as comfortable as he can and um let let you know let the sickness take its course and so could you imagine coming home with your son now to just say the doctor says we're going to give him three weeks to live um but again we are praying family we have been praying and so um, I made the decision again that whatever he wants, 
Malik, uh, Michael will get. And we did everything that we thought a little boy could could have. And I'll be honest with you, again, if you get if you had the opportunity to meet him, I'm telling you, when I'm thinking to put him uh in these lavish clothes and think that you know, give him all of the he's the one who's gonna say, No, Daddy, you don't need to do that for me. You don't need to do that for me. He is the one who can tell mommy when she now thinks in her mind that I have a son that has some cells in him that are generating and she starts to cry. He is the one who is going to rub her head and say, it's going to be all right. That's what Michael was. And um, it was three months later that we got into the habit of when his platelets get low, he goes and takes blood, but blood can only be given in Nassau. Okay. So we went to Nassau. That was December 13, 2002. I would never forget that day. We got on the flight, went to Nassau. Olive was supposed to pick us up from the airport. We waited, say, about... 20 minutes, Kendall came and he, I, I really saw him getting like weak. He was like, you know, I'm tired and could I lay on you and I need you to hold me and I saw that in him. We went into the car, Kendall came pick us up. He had to go and pick all of up on the way to the hospital. And we drove East Street, <clears throat> East Street to the hospital. And as soon as we reached to the bottom of the hill, like near the, near the police headquarters, that area, I saw my baby. <sighs> that was his last breath. He's laying in her lap. He was in my arms. And I saw him took a deep breath and breathe out. And he's just laying there. And I'm like, all of we need to hurry. We need to hurry. And she's speeding, speeding, trying to get to the hospital. I'm like, all if little Mike, something wrong. And he's speeding, she's speeding, speeding. We reached the accident and emergency. She parked right in the front, didn't turn the car off or anything. She just came to the back door and she took me, took him out of my arms and she was running in the, and I'm, I'm stunned, couldn't move. Shani came and she said, Cooley, you need to come out the car. You need to go. I need, let me park the car, go in with Olive. You need to, I, she stayed. I heard horns blowing to say for us to move the car and I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I was just there in the car sitting down. <clears throat> it came to the point where she put the car back in park and she came to the back door and she said, come, you have to come out. She had to guide me out into accident and emergency. I knew though, I knew he was gone. I knew he was gone. Cause I felt him hold me tight and then let me go. Okay. So I'm in Freeport. I'm in Freeport. And Mr. Greenslade calls me and says, what are you doing? I said to him, uh, I'm just cleaning up the yard. So he says, stop what you're doing. I need to go to the Nassau. Um, I jumped on the plane trying to figure out, is this police rel relative to police work? Or is he just wanting me to do something for him? But while I was on the plane, the 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 manager of Bahamas Air was a little bit helpful to me as if though I was a member of parliament that I'm supposed to be no no you go straight through um you sit at the first row hold on man you know Bahamas Air don't have a first class so <laughs> I I was there and I'm saying why are they real nice to me today and sure enough uh, got there again. I got picked up by Kenny again, and um, he took me there. 
And I'll say this, I, I don't know if I said it before, but being a police officer, I've seen a lot of tragedies, <clears throat> had the opportunity to do a lot of invest investigations. And I believe it prepared me for that particular day uh, for me to walk in a room and see my son on a silver table. And so Cooley and I are now at another place in our life where our only begotten son, our only son is now laying on a silver table. And a friend of ours is saying, Mike, y'all just leave. We'll take care of him. And so Pedro Ferguson, who Church of God of Prophecy, they, they, they took care of him. But for me, he, I, I want to move quickly because I know it's a little traumatic for, for Cooley. We're still young in this, y'all, just getting over it. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> wherever you are in your life, there are stages you have to go through. And so here we are with our only son, and I realized this five years later. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that for whosoever believes in him, you should not perish. God gave his son, his only son, for my sins. And the revelation slapped me right in the cross of my face to say, that's how much God loves us, that he would let his only son. And now I understood to have my only son die. And he didn't even die for mankind. Mm -hmm. But now I understand the revelation of what, for God so loved the world. And so we moved into another phase in our life. Um, I'm not ashamed to say this. I was not promiscuous. I didn't believe in having a lot of children. As a matter of fact, the truth be told, I only wanted that one son. And God gave it to me. And when he took him away, I didn't understand it. And as I started to declare the word some 13 years later, I understood what it meant to say when Samuel was asked, to go with his father to another place. I, I didn't understand that, but I don't want to run on with rhetoric. I digress. Uh, but I say to you, we have moved into this place, this next place, where I didn't want any more children because I didn't want that pain to feel it anymore. And I understand that. I, I understand... Um you feeling that way in terms of wow to have to go through this again but good news again and and you lost little mike and everybody even in the comments everybody who's met him has has echoed your sentiments and saying what a joy he was and a delight to be around and that he was just an angel and a special child and but three years later three years later after him going on to be with the Lord, you were blessed once again. So you get the news, you find, well, obviously y'all was doing some things. And then Cooley got pregnant again, got pregnant again three years later. And so how are you feeling, I mean, when you get this news that you're pregnant, any one of you jump in, uh, are you excited? Are you a little apprehensive? What are you saying? What are you? I want to be the one to jump in because, like I said, I didn't want any more children anymore. I didn't want to do that. So I told Cooley, however the Lord has to fix you, whatever we do, it's just for fun. <laughs> so that's really my thought. But as I told you, because I moved to Freeport, Mount Table was always on my mind because that's the church I came from. And I'm saying, he buried M M Michael at Mount Tabor. And while preaching a sermon, you remember me telling you I don't want any children anymore? Well, Bishop Ellis is the one who 
to me because I was saying that. He said, the Lord said, as a matter of fact, Mike, uh, I, 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 I want to tell you this. This is what the Lord told me to tell you this. I don't know what this means. But what happened with little Mike will never happen again. Those were his words by Datum. Mike, the Lord said to tell you, I don't know what you're going and what this means. He says, what happened to little Mike will never happen again. And I left the service. Um, Cooley and I, you know, was playing and we were fellowshipping. The end of the day, uh, she says to me, she is pregnant. Now, this is my story because I don't make girl child. So I knew if she pregnant, it only could be a boy. Just before we get to our second son, little Mike, I remember me, Olive, Manira. We were on Olive's porch. That's before he died. He came to get blood. You know, we would come often to get blood as needed. And you know what he said? He said, Auntie Olive, Auntie Manira, do you know that your children are in heaven waiting to come down to you? And everybody, little Mike, okay, you know, we, we get, you know, we throw him off. We, it, it we throw it off. Okay. Um, yeah, they're, they're waiting. They're waiting. They're waiting to come. And he's saying this. He keep on saying this, you know, and we just let that go. Three months after his death, Manira, my sister, she got pregnant first. While she was pregnant, I got pregnant with our second son. Manira had her daughter. I had, Manira had a daughter in January. I had Malik in August. Here comes God. Olive had Kesa in November. Now that's to say thank you, Jesus. That all, child pregnant. All wow. one, one year. Mm. So he was saying to us, and we never took it until we said, you know what? And when, when we were pregnant, and he said, we said to each other, you know, little Mike prophesied this to us. He prophesied that we our kids are in heaven waiting to come down. And I thought about it. I said, he had to go for them to come. And it was a joy for all three of us. It was a joy to know that God took one and he brought three into the family. I, if I could get deep, if I could really get spiritually deep, God blesses whatever is connected to you if you are in the vein of God. Those women we just called, I believe they were in the vein of God. Manira couldn't, didn't have a child. Olive didn't have a child. And I believe when little Mike spoke those words on the porch and they were there, they were connected. And I believe not because of me, but I believe because of a little boy named Michael Warnie Wilson, um, bless his name. I believe he he has done so much down here on this earth that a lot of us could learn from. Um, but but I, I'm just I'm honored by God to say that I'm His father. I'm honored by God to know that He caused me to mature. I'm I'm ecstatic to know that I get the revelation of why I have to walk the walk. And, and, and Miranda, I, I want to run straight to this thing. When Job lost all that he lost, a wife said to him, boy, you might as well curse God. And he says, no, make it. That's how I came and I'll go. But there's some scriptures, some chapters later that said, Job got double what he lost. Can I say to you, 
when God gave me this boy again, and she emailed the picture to me, that's the same little Mike. The only thing his head was a little longer. That's the same boy. That is the same boy. And I said, man, you know something? God, you so you you really funny, man. You took one life, gave me one, and then I know the audience out there, is, but listen, I tell you, I don't make girl child. And you know, me and this young lady was we was fellowshipping. And when she told me she was pregnant again, and her age, I listen, I knew <laughs> again it was a boy. But her mother, the prayers of her mother and her caused my little princess to come into this world. And ever since that day, my life has never been the same. And so uh, I thank God. Now he gives me a boy and a girl. A boy and a girl. And so God blesses her womb. God gives uh, to me what a it is that he thought that I would have lost, but I have doubled for my trouble. That's all I will say. Right. I, I'm, I'm just tearing up because the story is just so moving and God is just so amazing. And the way that you two have handled it with such grace. So you have Malik, you have the princess Mia. And, and and so God showed you who is creator, Mike, because you have a female child. <laughs> so he proved to you, he proved to you who's in charge, okay? That's just a point of information, by the way. But you have two amazing kids right now who are, uh, are bringing you equal joy um, in your lives as you, you celebrate them as parents today i am we are we are we're quickly running out of time but tell us about malik who he is tell us about maya who she is and then when you're finished with that i i will want you to 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 talk about the kind of life that you see for them and then i want you to speak into their future but tell tell us about malik and maya because they are their own unique personalities of course um, Miranda, I, again, I am humbled to even be uh, her husband because she didn't have to say yes, but she did. Um, but there is something that is in my spirit that I really want to say before we move on to talking about um, Malik and Mia. When, when God blesses you, when God blesses you with a child, God gives you an assignment. That is your assignment. I don't want to run over quickly. While we were going through the death, sickness, and separation of us, that was the challenge in our relationship. If I get to our glory stage and don't tell you about the troubles that we had in the marriage. I believe this whole show would be for nothing because it is important for me to say right here. I heard Bishop Ellis said this to Eddie Long um, just before his case came up. He said this in New Birth's pulpit. A relationship that has never been tested is a relationship that should not be trusted. Here's what I got from that. Every time I think of this woman, we got tested to the place where when we are now in our glory years with two children that replaced the one, I have to say, young people, and even old people alike, go through your testing because the testing is going to make you love better at the end when all is well. So could you imagine you are broke now and your husband can't pay 
and he can't take care and then you still love him and then one day a government gone contract gives him 1.2 million dollars and you're able to live a very comfortable life but you stayed in the testing time that's what i want to say miranda we went through the testing with each other where she is upset with me i'm thinking i'm doing and so i don't want to rush too much to the glory because a lot of people see our glory but didn't up to today know our story and you don't want to let people know you can see the fluff but you don't know what they had to do to get it and so our cost for this anointing for this love it was very costly and i thank god that we made it through today we have a 16 year old boy who's getting ready to go away to school we have a 10 year old girl who is the boss i she is the boss she tells us which car we drive by the way god has favored me to have a few in the garage and she says i want to go in the limousine today this guy in the schoolyard she wanted to get dropped to school in the limousine then when she has a birthday she is the one who says we're going to invite all of the children in the school and take them for a ride i'm like but baby you got to pay for that no baby that's for me okay i'm saying we have a wonderful wonderful uh group of children who god has blessed us with that I pronounce the blessing over their life. I pronounce the favor of God over their life. I believe he is going to do wonders in their life. Not because of us. You see? But I believe because of the foundation that our parents gave to us. Her mother, who is the big, broad, church of God, a prophecy hat, they tell you, listen, if sin is in the camp, you got to run that out, even if you have to beat them. And uh, obviously, my father, who, again, Bishop Phil Wilson, who has taught us, listen, man, this is how you take care of family. And so I believe they had a good structure. And so we are we are tremendously blessed to even be on this show, telling our story. But again, I recognize a long time ago that it will be a testimony someday I don't know when, but I believe it's going to be a testimony. And I believe today is that day when we come full circle on telling the story of Michael Wanye, little General Wilson, uh, and how he has impacted our life, how he moved our marriage, how he brought us together again. And um, he has set us on a place that we're sorry, man. We're sorry. She fusses me sometimes. i like, boy, we can only call the general, but there she is. Uh, we, are, we are a wonderful place in God. Um, we just would like to be a blessing to some family out there uh, on this show, Miranda. Thank you very much for having us. We are delighted to be here with you. Cooley, I want you to... to tell us throughout the process of all that you've experienced to uh, the nurturing of, of Mike and his demise and, and the nurturing of your children now what are some of the key lessons that you've learned first as a woman second as a wife third as a mother so what are some of the lessons that you've learned I would say always keep God at the center of your marriage. Always put each other first. <clears throat> As they go by, yeah, you're going to get upset. You know, we crack a joke with each other. Like, okay, we probably getting old. So we'll say, um, we'll disagree about something and then like a couple minutes go by, 15, 20 minutes. I'm like, what are we supposed to be mad? It's like I can't even remember what we're supposed to be mad about. <laughs> but that had to get you had to get there after mature maturity. 
You understand? You just didn't get there just right away. So it took t- it takes takes time. And I would say go through your process. Go through your process. Try not to to cut the process in this. Go through your process. Keep God in the center. Love your husband. Love your spouse. Love your spouse. Sometimes they're going to get on your nerves. But love your spouse. Olive, are you listening? (laughs) Love your spouse through it all. Love your spouse. And he has blessed me with those two children. They are my world. Who who blessed you? God has blessed me. (laughs) God has blessed me with my boy and my girl. And I just say thank. I thank every time. And, you know, people would look and say, oh, when Malik turns, when he was like seven, I'm like, oh, God, thank you. Then eight. Thank you, Jesus. I praise you. I magnify you. I give you glory for this little boy. Nine, as it go on, and I just say, because of what we've been through, I mean, little Mike died at the age of six, and Malika is 16, Mia is 10, no sickness. I lift my hands and I say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That's the best thing that could happen for me. Hallelujah. To see there at this stage. And coming into their own, especially Princess, she have her own little thing going on. So we just have to go with the flow with her. She already into her own. She she wears high heel shoes to bed. I don't understand it. High heel shoe with night pajamas. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> but we praise God for where we at. We praise him for where he's bought us from. And we have to go through our process knowing that he was in the midst at all times, I think that's what kept us. We're getting ready. Oops. Running out of time. Let me see some comments here. Um, I see. Come on. Awesome. That's very right. Boss, lady. Uh, thank you. What an amazing show. God is awesome. Thank you for sharing. Newton says, Mike and Cooley, I'm singing for you. My God is awesome, awesome, awesome. Manera says, I come in agreement with you, my brother. No weapon that is formed against me or them shall prosper in Jesus' name. Monique says, thank you both for sharing your story. I know it wasn't easy. Sonika says, beautiful and real couple. Uh, Joba says, hallelujah, glory. Ricardo Grant, I, I wonder if that's the bishop. Good night, bishop, if that's you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, uh, yeah, and people just celebrating with you all. Marie Allen says, very encouraging, very encouraging. So I want to leave some parting words um, with you, uh, Mike. What do you want to say to, to couples who may be faced with insurmountable challenges that are really beyond their control as you two um were faced with a challenge that was beyond your control but but by god's grace you were able to weather it in your hair to to really share uh and to encourage and inspire others to do the same so i'm going to leave some parting words with you okay that is the bishop good night sir to speak to those people who maybe going through or as as my bishop would say give them an early word for a later situation for someone who may not yet experience something just be able to speak into their lives at this moment let me say this very quickly let me say this real quickly god ordained a marriage it is an institution ordained by god secondly It is not good that a man should be alone. Thirdly, when God says, whenever you find a wife, you find a good thing. All three of those things I just said are very pivotal. Here's the catch. 
for those people who find themselves going through, maybe, maybe it is testing your relationship. If you are one of those people who are going through, I want to say to you, not only just being spiritual, but you really need to be mature. What is it being mature? Finding out, listen, if I communicated with her, most of my troubles would have been over. And I'm submitting to you maturity in your troubles. What could I do wrong? What could I do to make things right? That's communication. But most of all, it's maturity. So I want to talk to those, those couples out there. If you can only be mature, go through your times of testing. Talk to God so that you could get the guidance. But remember, if God permitted it, that means he knows you can handle it. So it no, it's not an issue that God says you don't have to go through it. Walk through it. But maturity, communication. Now, I, I, I want to talk to some wives too. Listen, when you are dealing with a man, you know, for us, we real logical thinking. But most of us, most of us, we are seers. So if you really don't want to see, you want us to see this thing called love, compassion. I, I believe uh, women, men, all of us need to do our part to make sure we extend ourselves so that when we look back at what we have walked through, we would be like us today. We would say, I was glad when I went through why? Because now that I'm in a good place, I'm with the woman who stayed with me, that the money that I have, she could spend that. The car that I have in the driveway, she could drive that. As a matter of fact, she went on the Mercedes dealership and said, that's what she wants. So I'm saying, it's nothing for me to do that for her. Because man, listen, when my child was sick, she was there. When my child passed, she was there. When I couldn't make up my mind, if I want, you know, to get my, she was there. All of these things, she was there with me. So I want to tell that couple, please, man, be mature, but stay with God, but also communicate. And you will see the hand of God work in your ministry, I mean, in your marriage. Hey man, I am so blessed that you two have spent this time with us. If you just join us, oh, hi, Dr. Denise, thanks for tuning in. Stephanie, thanks for tuning in as well. Listen, this has been Swerve with me. This is a show where each week, Sundays, 8 o'clock, we have adult conversations for mature audiences only. And I speak to people who have overcome challenges and they're not afraid to show their scars and speak their truth. I am so godly proud of you both. I speak blessings of an abundance over you that unlike you've ever experienced before and especially in this new chapter y'all better don't leave me out because I'm in it all the way cheering you on for sure cheering you on for sure listen we're gonna win together we're gonna win together I believe that something amazing is going to happen and as good as it's been to date eyes had not seen and heirs have not heard. It hasn't even entered. You could imagine that it hasn't even entered into the heart of man what God has in store for you all because you love him. And that love is demonstrated. We see it. We feel it for all of those who are viewing out there. So thank you so much for your transparency. Thank you for your yes and for your willingness to come and swerve with me tonight. And I want to say thank you to all of you who have participated in the comments. I have a adored and enjoyed this um this is what we do each week when you get a chance stop by and say hello let me know you're out there pauline says the best is yet to come stephanie says thank you lord this show was priceless love it coolie i love you uh dr denise says this is sound as she was referring to the information that you were given mike and she says the information was powerful and so once again, thank you for swerving with me tonight. Until next week, God bless and see you guys soon. Bye-bye, everybody.